Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our live reading of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. I am Libba Beecham, Director of Media and Communications here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. And you, I am here in the uh, Cottrell Digital Studio reading today. If you are just joining us, I do recommend that you go back to our part one um, to have the entire story. And you can find that on our YouTube channel or you can go to our Facebook videos tab. Now, before we get started, I did want to review some nautical terms um, that apparently every captain should know. So, uh, because we've come across some uh, vocab words that I was not particularly familiar with. For instance, I did not know exactly um, the measurement of a league, which I found is, um, let's see, what was it? It was about three miles. So. A, uh, so if we're talking about 20,000, um, that's, that's quite a distance, right? <laughs> so let's go through some nautical terms before we get started today. So first we have, uh, let's see, let's just go through a few of these. We have um, the one that we have certainly come across already is the poop deck. And let's see, this says, um, <laughs> you should be thinking of the restroom, but it's not. It's just part of the boat. You get to roam about freely. It's a standard rude term used in boating. <laughs> and um, I did also find, let's see, a picture that will help us. So let me get that going. Let's see here. There we are. So you can see it's, it's this part. So um, when our characters were on the poop deck, it was a good way to see out into the distance because it's, it's higher up on the ship. So we've got that one. And let's go back to our nautical terms. We have um, a porthole. It merely me. Oh, <laughs> wait, what is this? Funny nautical terms. Okay, let's go to common nautical terms. Okay, so we have the bow. Uh, this refers to the front end of the boat. Forward, this is used when you are moving toward the front end of the boat or the bow. Aft is used to describe your movement towards the rear end of the boat, more like saying someone is going aft. Uh, ahead refers to the movement of a boat in a forward direction. A stern refers to the backward movement of a boat. Topside, moving from the lower deck of the boat to the upper deck of the ship. Amidships refers to the central part of the boating vessel. Port quarter, this is the rear side, the rear left side of the boat. Then you have starboard quarter, which is the rear right side of the boat. <laughs> The port bow, this is the front left side of the boat, starboard bow, you probably guessed it already, the front right side of the boat, and uh, starboard is when standing at the rear of the boat and looking forward, starboard is the entire right side of the ship. So we have the port side is the left, starboard is right. Leeward, this is also known as lee, it's the opposite uh, direction to the movement of the wind. Windward is going in the direction of the wind. Let's see, the stern is the rear end of the boat. We have, let's see, I'm going to see if there's any that we have actually come across so far. We have the um, headway, the rate of progress in sailing. The helm is a steering apparatus. The keel is the uh, central structural basis of the hull. I know we've come across the word hull, and that is the bottom of the ship. So I think that's a fair amount for, to get us started. As we come across, I, I did discover that because I'm using the Kindle app, I'm able to um, find the definition uh, as we read. And I know there were a few, <laughs> there were a few words I was having trouble with uh, yesterday. One of them was, let's see, how is it pronounced? Indefatigable. Indefatigable. And that, let's see. Indefatigable. I believe that may, may, meant giving away, giving way to fatigue, being tired. But let's, let's make sure that's correct. Indefatigable definition. So that is, um, persisting tirelessly. So our main 
characters are certainly indefatigable. <laughs> so now if there's a, a, any words that I come across that I'm not familiar with, um, then we can look those up in the dictionary right in the app, which is pretty cool. All right, so let's get started. Uh, we left off with meeting a, a new character, Captain Nemo, and he seems really interesting. Um, lots of mystery surrounding him so far, and it seems that what we have gathered from Captain Nemo is that he has this extraordinary um, uh, vessel and what, what seems to be a submarine. And uh, it, it seems that he has an entire crew and, and he has used this vessel, as far as we know, to escape the, the world. Um, so I, we're going to learn more about him, I'm sure, but uh, Monsieur Aranax, our, our, um, our protagonist and the voice of this story, a lot of intrigue in, in this uh, chapter so far. So why don't we dive right in? <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm just going to make sure our audio is good to go. All right, awesome. Oh. Let's see. Okay. Seems like we might have, uh, if there is any connection um, issue, it, it should automatically uh, restart. And you may need to um, refresh your page if it seems like it's, it's freezing or something. But so far, seems like we're good. Let's dive in. So. Let me find our book here, and there we are. So, uh, Captain Nemo was just leading Monsieur Aranax um, toward the dining room. So here we go, I'll back up a little bit from where we left off last time. I followed Captain Nemo, and as soon as I had passed through the door, I found myself in a kind of passage lighted by electricity, similar to the waist of a ship. After we had proceeded a dozen yards, a second door opened before me. I then entered a dining room, decorated and furnished in severe taste. High oaken sideboards, inlaid with ebony, stood at two extremities of the room, and upon their shelves glittered china, porcelain, and glass of inestimable value. The plate on the table sparkled in the rays which the luminous ceiling shed around, while the light was tempered and softened by exquisite paintings. In the center of the room was a table richly laid out. Captain Nemo indicated the place I was to occupy. The breakfast consisted of a certain number of dishes, the contents of which were furnished by the sea alone, and I was ignorant of the nature and mode of preparation of some of them, I acknowledge that they were good, but they had a peculiar flavor, which I easily became accustomed to. These different elements appeared to me to be rich in phosphorus, and I thought they must have a marine origin. Captain Nemo looked at me. I asked him no questions, but he guessed my thoughts, and answered of his own accord the questions which I was burning to address to him. The greater part of these dishes are unknown to you, he said to me. However, you may partake of them without fear. They are wholesome and nourishing. For a long time I have renounced the food of the earth, and I am never ill now. My crew, who are healthy, are fed on the same food. So, said I, all these eatables are the produce of the sea. Yes, Professor, the sea supplies all my wants. Sometimes I cast my nets in tow, and I draw them in, ready to break. Sometimes I hunt in the midst of this element, which appears to be inaccessible to man, and quarry the game which dwells in my submarine forests. My flocks, like those of Neptune's old shepherds, graze fearlessly in the immense prairies of the ocean. I have a vast property there, which I cultivate myself, and which is always sown by the hand of the creator of all things. I can understand perfectly, sir, that your nets furnish excellent fish for your table. I can understand also that you hunt aquatic game in your submarine forests, but I cannot understand at all how a particle of meat, no matter how small, can figure in your bill of fare. This, which you believe to be meat, Professor, is nothing else than fillet of turtle. Here are also some dolphin's livers, which you take to be rug out of pork. My cook is a clever fellow who excels in dressing these various products of the ocean. Taste all these dishes. 
Here is a preserve of sea cucumber, which a Malay would declare to be unrivaled in the world. Here is a cream of which the milk has been furnished by the cetacea and the sugar by the great fucus of the North Sea. Let's, let's see what that is. So, that is a seaweed of a large genus of brown allergy, a fucus of the North Sea. And lastly, permit me to offer you some preserve of anemones, which is equal to that of the most delicious fruits. I tasted more from curiosity than uh, as a connoisseur, whilst Captain Nemo enchanted me with his extraordinary stories. You like the sea, Captain? Yes, I love it. The sea is everything. It covers seven-tenths of the terrestrial globe. Its breath is pure and healthy. It is an immense desert where man is never lonely, for he feels life stirring on all sides. The sea is only the embodiment of a supernatural and wonderful existence. It is nothing but love and emotion. It is the living infinite, as one of your poets has said. In fact, Professor, nature manifests, manifests herself in it by her three kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, and animal. The sea is the vast reservoir of nature. The globe began with sea, so to speak, and who knows if it will not end with it. In it is supreme tranquility. The sea does not belong to despots. Upon its surface, men can still exercise unjust laws, fight, tear one another to pieces, and be carried away with terrestrial horrors. But at 30 feet below its level, their reign ceases, their influence is quenched, and their powers disappear. Ah, sir, live, live in the bosom of the waters. There only is independence. There I recognize no masters. There I am free. Captain Nemo suddenly became silent in the midst of this enthusiasm, by which he was quite carried away. For a few moments he paced up and down, much agitated. Then he became more calm, regained his accustomed coldness of, of expression, and turning towards me, Now, Professor, said he, if you wish to go over the Nautilus, I am at your service. Captain Nemo rose. I followed him. A double door contrived at the back of the dining room opened, and I entered a room equal in dimensions to that which I had just quitted. It was a library. High pieces of furniture, of black violet ebony inlaid with brass, supported upon their, their wide shelves a great number of books uniformly bound. They followed the shape of the room, terminating at its, the lower part in huge divans. Diva divans without a back or oh okay say so a seat without a long low sofa without a back or arms a divan covered with brown leather which were curved to afford the greatest comfort light movable desks made to slide in and out at will allowed one to rest one's book while reading in the center stood an immense table, covered with pamphlets, amongst which were some newspapers, already of old date. The electric light flooded everything. It was shed from four unpolished globes, half sunk in the volutes of the ceiling. A spiral scroll, characteristic, or a deep water marine mollusk with a thick spiral shell. Ah. Unpolished globes, half sunk in the volutes of the ceiling. I looked with real admiration at this room, so ingeniously fitted up, and I could scarcely believe my eyes. Captain Nemo, said I to my host, who had just thrown himself on one of the divans, this is a library which would do honor to more than one of the continental palaces, and I am absolutely astounded when I consider that it can follow you to the bottom of the seas. Where could one find greater solitude or silence, Professor? replied Captain Nemo. Did your study in the museum afford you such perfect quiet? No, sir, and I must confess that it is a very poor one after yours. You must have six or seven thousand volumes here. Twelve thousand, Monsieur Aranax. These are the only ties which bind me to the earth, but I had done with the world on the day when my Nautilus plunged for the first time beneath the waters. 
That day I bought my last volumes, my last pamphlets, my last papers, and from, the, from that time I wish to think that men no longer think or write. These books, Professor, are at your service besides, and you can make use of them freely. I thanked Captain Nemo and went up to the shelves of the library. Works on science, morals, and literature abounded in every language, but I did not see one single work on political economy. That subject appeared to be strictly prescribed. Strange to say, all these books were irregularly arranged in whatever language they were written, and this medley proved that cap the captain of the Nautilus must have read indiscriminately the books which he took up by chance. Sir, said I to the captain, I thank you for having placed this library at my disposal. It contains treasures of silence, science, and I shall profit by them. This room is not only a library, said Captain Nemo, it is also a smoking room. A smoking room, I cried. Then one may smoke on board, certainly. Then, sir, I am forced to believe that you have kept up a communication with Havana. Not any, answered the captain. Accept this cigar, Monsieur Aranax, and though it does not come from Havana, you will be pleased with it, if you are a connoisseur. I took the cigar which was offered me. Its shape recalled the London ones, but it seemed to be made of leaves of gold. I lighted it at a little brazier, which is a portable heater consisting of a pan or stand for holding lighted coals. A bra brazier, which was supported upon an elegant bronze stem and drew the first whiffs with the delight of a lover of smoking who has not smoked for two days. It is excellent, but it is not tobacco. No, answered the captain. This tobacco comes neither from Havana nor from the east. It is a kind of seaweed, rich in nicotine, with which the sea provides me, but somewhat sparingly. At that moment, Captain Nemo opened a door which stood opposite to that by which I had entered the library, and I passed into an immense drawing room, splendidly lighted. It was a vast, four-sided room, 30 feet long, 18 wide, and 15 high. A luminous ceiling decorated with light arabesques shed a soft, clear light over the marvels accumulated in this museum. For it was, in fact, a museum in which an intelligent and prodigal hand had gathered all the treasures of nature and art with the artistic confusion which distinguishes a painter's studio. Thirty first-rate pictures, uniformly framed, separated by bright drapery, ornamented the walls, which were hung with tapestry of severe design. I saw works of great value, the greater part of which I had admired in the special collections of Europe and in, in the exhibitions of paintings. The several schools of the old masters were represented by a Madonna of Raphael, a virgin of Leonardo da Vinci, a nymph of Correggio, a woman of Titan, an adoration of Veronese, an assumption of Murillo, Mar Mar a portrait of Holbein, a monk of Velasquez, Ve Ve Velasquez, a martyr of Ribera, a fair of Rubens, two Flemish landscapes of Tenere's, three little genre pictures of Gerard Dow, Metsu, and Paul Potter, two specimens of Gericault and Proudhon, and some sea species of Bacchusen and of Vernet. Amongst the works of modern painters were pictures with the signatures of Delacroix, Ingres, Descamps, Troyon, Messonnier, Dabigny, etc., and some admirable statues in marble and bronze, after the finest antique models, stood upon pedestals in the corners of this magnificent museum. Amazement, as the captain of the Nautilus had predicted, had already begun to take possession of me. Professor, said the strange man, you must excuse the unceremonious way in which I receive you and the disorder of this room. Sir, I answered, without seeking to know who you are, I recognize in you an artist. An amateur, nothing more, sir. Formerly I loved to collect these beautiful works created by the hand of man. I sought them greedily and ferreted them out here's that word, in, indefatigably, <laughs> and I have been able to bring together some objects of great value. 
These are my last souvenirs of that world which is dead to me. In my eyes, your modern artists are already old. They have two or three thousand years of existence. I can found them in my own mind. Masters have no age. Are, and these musicians, said I, pointing out some works of, of Weber, Rossini, Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, Mayer, Beer, Harold, Wagner, Auber, Gonad, and a number of others scattered over a large model piano organ which occupied one of the panels of the drawing room. These musicians, replied Captain Nemo, are the contemporaries of Orpheus, for in the memory of the dead all chronological differences are effaced. And I am dead, Professor, as much dead as those of your friends who are sleeping six feet under the earth. Captain Nemo was silent and seemed lost in a profound reverie. I contemplated him with deep interest, analyzing in silence the strange expression of his countenance. Leaning on his elbow against an angle of a costly mosaic table, he no longer saw me. He had forgotten my presence. I did not disturb this reverie and continued my observation of the curiosities which enriched this drawing room. Under elegant glass cases fixed by copper rivets were classed and labeled the most precious productions of the sea which had ever been presented to the eye of a naturalist. My delight as a professor may not be conceived. The division caning the zoophytes presented the most curious specimens of the two groups of polypi and ech echinoderms, which are, oh, okay, no definition there. In the first group, the tubipores were gorgones arranged like a fan, soft sponges of Syria, ices of Molochas, penetules, and admirable <laughs> virgularia of the Norwegian seas, variegated un unbelulare. Oh, there's lots and lots of words. <laughs> Let's see, this is, okay, no definition there. Uh, Alicinariae, a whole series of madripores which my master Milne Edwards has so cleverly classified, amongst which I remark some wonderful flabilinae or oculae of the island of Bourbon, the Neptune's car of the Antilles, superb varieties of corals. In short, every species of those curious polypi of which entire islands are formed which one day become continents. Of the echinoderms remarkable for their coating of spines, asteri, sea stars, pantacrinae, comatules, asterophons, echini, holotheri, etc., rep represented individually a complete collection of this group. A somewhat nervous, con Concleologist would certainly have fainted before other more numerous cases in which were classified the specimens of mollusks. It was a collection of inestimable value, which time fails me to describe minutely. Amongst these specimens, I will quote from memory only the elegant royal hammerfish of the Indian Ocean, whose regular white spots stood out brightly on a red and brown ground, an imperial spondyle, bright colored, bristling with spines, a rare specimen in the European museums. I estimated its value at not less than 1,000 pounds, a common hammerfish of the seas of New Holland, which is only procured with difficulty, exotic bucardia of the Senegal, fragile white bivalve shells, which a breath might shatter like a soap bubble, several varieties of the aspirigum of Java, a kind of cal calcareous tube edged with leafy folds and much debated by amateurs, a whole series of trochae, some of greenish yellow found in the American seas, others of reddish brown, natives of Australian waters, others from the Gulf of Mexico, remarkable for their imbricated shell, stellari found in the southern seas, and at last, the rarest of all, the magnificent spur of New Zealand, and every description of delicate and fragile shells to which science has given appropriate names. Apart in separate compartments were spread out of chaplets of pearls of the greatest beauty, which reflected the electric light in little sparks of fire, pink pearls torn from the pin 
Pina Marina of the Red Sea, green pearls of the Haliotite iris, yellow, blue, and black pearls, the curious productions of the divers' mollusks, mollusks of every ocean, and certain mussels of the water courses of the north. Lastly, several specimens of inestimable value, which had been gathered from the rarest pentadines. Some of these pearls were larger than a pigeon's egg and were worth as much. And more than that which the travel, traveler Tavernier sold to the Shah of Persia for three millions and surpassed the one in the possession of the Imam of Muscat, which I had to believe to be unrivaled in the world. Therefore, to estimate the value of this collection was simply impossible. Captain Nemo must have expended millions in the acquirement of these various specimens, and I was thinking what source he could have drawn from to have been able to thus gratify his fancy for collecting, when I was interrupted by these words. You are examining my shells, Professor. Unquestionably, they must be interesting to a naturalist, but... For me, they have a far greater charm, for I have collected them all with my own hand, and there is not a sea on the face of the globe which has escaped my researches. I can understand, Captain, the delight of wandering about in the midst of such riches. You are one of those who have collected their treasure themselves. No museum in Europe possesses such a collection of the produce of the, of the ocean. But if I exhaust all my admiration upon it, I shall have none left for the vessel which carries it. I do not wish to pry into your secrets, but I must confess that this Nautilus, with the motive power which is confined in it, the, the contrivances which enable it to be worked, the powerful agent which propels it, all excite my curiosity to the highest pitch. I see suspended on the walls of this room instruments of whose use I am ignorant. You will find these same instruments in my own room, Professor, where I shall have much pleasure in explaining their use to you. But first come and inspect the cabin which is set apart for your own use. You must see how you will be accommodated on board the Nautilus. I followed Captain Nemo, who by one of the doors opening from each panel of the drawing room regained the waist. He conducted me towards the bow and there I found not a cabin, but an elegant room with a bed, dressing table, and several other pieces of excellent furniture. I could only thank my host. Your room adjoins mine, said he, opening a door, and mine opens into the drawing room that we have just quitted. I entered the captain's room. It had a severe, almost a monkish aspect. A small iron bedstead, a table, some articles for the toilet, the whole lighted by a skylight. No comforts, the strictest necess necessaries only. Captain Nemo pointed to a seat. Be so good as to sit down, he said. I seated myself, and he began thus. Take a short, short coffee break. I apologize for all those scientific terms, but I think we can gather that for the, the point being that for Monsieur Aranax, this is uh, just a, a room of wonders. It's everything he could possibly uh, want as a naturalist. So I think it's going to be quite tempting if he is invited to stay on the Nautilus. So we'll see uh, what choice he makes. Just going to see how we're doing on Facebook. Okay, great, great. So let's continue. This chapter is titled All by Electricity. Sir, said Captain Nemo, showing me the instruments hanging on the walls of his room, here are the contrivances required for the navigation of the Nautilus. Here, as in the drawing room, I have them always under my eyes, and they indicate my position and exact direction in the middle of the ocean. Some are known to you, such as the thermometer, which gives the internal temperature of the Nautilus, the barometer, which indicates the weight of the air and foretells the changes of the weather, the hy hygrometer, which marks the dryness of the atmosphere, the storm glass, the contents of which, by decomposing, announce the approach of tempests, the compass, which guides my course, the sextant, which shows the latitude by the altitude of the sun, the chronometers, by which I calculate the longitude, and glasses for day and night, which I use to examine the points of the horizon when the Nautilus rises to the surface of the waves. 
These are the usual nautical instruments, I replied, and I know the use of them. But these others, no doubt, answer to the particular requirements of the Nautilus. This dial with movable needle is a manometer, is it not? It is actually a manometer, but by communication with the water, whose external pressure it indicates, it gives our depth at the same time. And these other instruments, to the use of which I cannot guess? Here, Professor, I ought to give you some explanations. Will you be kind enough to listen to me? He was silent for a few moments. Then he said, There is a powerful agent, obedient, rapid, easy, which conforms to every use and reigns supreme on board my vessel. Everything is done by means of it. It lights, warms it, and is the soul of my mechanical apparatus. This agent is electricity. Electricity? I cried in surprise. Yes, sir. Nevertheless, Captain, you possess an extreme rapidity of movement, which does not agree well with the power of electricity. Until now, its dynamic force has remained under restraint and has only been able to produce a small amount of power. Professor, said Captain Nemo, my electricity is not everybody's. You know what seawater is composed of. In a thousand grams are found 96.5% of water and about two and two-thirds percent of chloride of sodium. Then, in a smaller quantity, chlorides of magnesium and of potassium, bromide of magnesium, sulfate of magnesia, sulfate and carbonate of lime. You see, then, that chloride of sodium forms a large part of it. So, it is this sodium that I extract from the seawater, and of which I compose my ingredients. I allow all to the ocean. It produces electricity, and electricity gives heat, light, motion, and, in a word, life to the Nautilus. But not the air you breathe? Oh, I could manufacture the air necessary for my consumption, but it is useless. Before I go up to the surface of the water when I please, because I go up to the surface of the water when I please. However, if electricity does not furnish me with air to breathe, it works at least the powerful pumps that are stored in spacious reservoirs and which enable me to prolong at need and as long as I will my stay in the depths of the sea. It gives a uniform and unintermittent light, which the sun does not. Now, look at this clock. It is electrical and goes with a regularity that defies the best chronometers. I have divided it into 24 hours, like the Italian clocks, because for me there is neither night nor day, sun nor moon, but only that factitious light that I take with me to the bottom of the sea. Look, just now, it is 10 o'clock in the morning. Exactly. Another application of electricity. This dial hanging in front of us indicates the speed of the Nautilus. An electric thread puts it in communication with the screw, and the needle indicates the real speed. <laughs> Look, now we are spinning along with a uniform speed of 15 miles an hour. It is marvelous, and I see, Captain, you were right to make use of this agent that takes the place of wind, water, and steam. We have not finished, Monsieur Aronnax, said Captain Nemo, rising. If you will allow me, we will examine the stern of the Nautilus. Really, I knew already the interior part of the submarine boat, of which this is the exact division, starting from the ship's head. The dining room, five yards long, separated by the library by a watertight partition. The library, five yards long. The large drawing room, ten yards long, separated by the captain's room by a second watertight partition. The said room, five yards in length. Mine, two and a half yards, and lastly, a reservoir of air, seven and a half yards, that extended to the bows. Total length, 35 yards, or 150, 105 feet. The partitions had doors that were shut hermetically by means of India rubber instruments, and they ensured the safety of the Nautilus in case of a leak. I followed Captain Nemo through the waist and arrived at the center of the boat, there was a sort of well that opened between two partitions. An iron ladder fastened with an iron hook to the partition led to the upper end. I asked the captain what the ladder was used for. It leads to the small boat, he, he said. What, you have a boat? I exclaimed in surprise. Of course, an excellent vessel, light and insubmersible, that serves either as a fishing or as a pleasure boat. 
But then, when you wish to embark, you are obliged to come to the surface of the water? Not at all. This boat is attached to the upper part of the hull of the Nautilus and occupies a cavity made for it. It is decked quite watertight and held together by solid bolts. This ladder leads to a manhole made in the hull of the Nautilus that corresponds with a similar hole made in the side of the boat. By this double opening, I get into the small vessel. They shut the one belonging to the Nautilus, I shut the other one by means of screw pressure. I undo the bolts, and the little boat goes up to the surface of the sea with prodigious rapidity. I then open the panel of the bridge, carefully shut till then. I mast it, hoist my sail, take my oars, and I'm off. But how do you get back on board? I do not come, I do not come back, Monsieur Aranax. The Nautilus comes to me. By your orders? By my orders. An electric thread connects us. I telegraph to it, and that is enough. Really, said I, astonished at these marvels, nothing can be more simple. After having passed by the cage of the staircase that led to the platform, I saw a cabin six feet long, in which Conceal and Ned Land, enchanted with their repast, were devouring it with avid avidity. Then a door opened into a kitchen nine feet long, situated between the large storerooms. Their electricity, better than gas itself, did all the cooking. The streams under the furnaces gave out to the sponges of patina, a, a heat which was regularly kept up and distributed. They also heated a distilling apparatus, which by evaporation furnished excellent drinkable water. Near this kitchen was a bathroom, comfortably furnished with hot and cold water taps. Next to the kitchen was the berth room of the vessel, 16 feet long, but the door was shut and I could not see the management of it, which might have given me an idea of the number of men employed on board the Nautilus. At the bottom was a fourth partition that separated this office from the engine room. A door opened, and I found myself in the compartment where Captain Nemo, certainly an engineer of a very high order, had arranged his locomotive machinery. This engine room, clearly lighted, did not measure less than 65 feet in length. It was divided into two parts. The first contained the materials for producing electricity, and the second the machinery that connected it with the screw. I examined it with great interest in order to understand the machinery of the Nautilus. You see, said the captain, I use Bunsen's con contrivances, not Rumorf's. Those would not have been powerful enough. Bunsen's are fewer in number, but strong and large, which experience proves to be the best. The electricity produced passes forward where it works by electromagnets of great size on a system of levers and cogwheels that transmit the movement to the axle of the screw. This one, the diameter of which is 19 feet, and the thread 23 feet, performs about 120 revolutions in a second. And you get, then, a speed of 50 miles an hour. I have seen the Nautilus maneuver before the Abraham Lincoln, and I have my own ideas as to its speed. But this, this is not enough. We, we must see where we go. We must be able to direct it to the right, to the left, above, below. How do you get to great depths where you find an increasing resistance, which is rated by hundreds of atmospheres? How do you return to the surface of the ocean? And how do you maintain yourselves in the requisite medium? Am I asking too much? Not at all, Professor, replied the captain, captain with some hesitation, since you may never leave this submarine boat. Come into the saloon. It is our usual study, and there you will learn all you want to know about the Nautilus. Chapter 7, Some Figures. Let's see how we're doing. <laughs> all right, doing great. A moment after we were seated on a divan in the saloon smoking, the captain showed me a sketch that gave the plan, section, and elevation of the Nautilus, then he began his description in these words. Here, Monsieur Aranax, are the several dimensions of the boat, the boat you are in. It is an elongated, elongated cylinder with conical ends. It is very like a cigar in shape, a shape already adopted in London in several constructions of the same sort. The length of this cylinder, from stem to stern, is exactly 232 feet, and its maximum breadth is, is 26 feet. 
It is not built quite like your long voyage steamers, but its lines are sufficiently long and its curves prolonged enough to allow the water to slide off easily and oppose no obstacle to its passage. These two dimensions enable you to obtain by a simple calculation the surface and cubic contents of the Nautilus. Its area measures 6,032 feet and its contents about 1,500 cubic yards. That is to say, when completely immersed, it displaces 50,000 feet of water and or weighs 1,500 tons. When I made the plans for this submarine vessel, I meant that nine-tenths should be submerged. Consequently, it ought only to displace nine-tenths of its bulk. That is to say, only to weigh that number of tons. I ought not, therefore, to have exceeded that weight, constructing it on the aforesaid dimensions. The Nautilus is composed of two hulls, one inside, the other outside, joined by T-shaped irons, which render it very strong. Indeed, owing to this cellular arrangement, it resists like a block, as if it were solid. Its sides cannot yield, it coheres spontaneously, and not by the closeness of its rivets, and its perfect union of these materials enables it to defy the roughest seas. These two hulls are composed of steel plates, whose density is from 0.7 to 0.8 of that water. The first is not less than two inches and a half thick and weighs 394 tons. The second envelope, the keel, 20 inches high and 10 thick, weighs only 62 tons. The engine, the ballast, the several accessories and apparatus appendages, the partitions and bulkheads weigh 961.62 tons. Do you follow all this? I do. Then, when the Nautilus is afloat under these circumstances, one-tenth is out of the water. Now, if I have made reservoirs of a size equal to this tenth, or capable of holding 150 tons, and if I fill them with water, the boat, weighing then 1,507 tons, will be completely immersed. That would happen, Professor. These reservoirs are in the lower part of the Nautilus. I turn on taps and they fill and the vessel sinks that had been just, and, and the vessel sinks that had just been level with the surface. Well, Captain, but now we have come to the real difficulty. I can understand your rising to the surface, but diving below the surface does not your submarine contrivance encounter a pressure and consequently undergo, undergo an upward thrust of one atmosphere for every 30 feet of water, just about 15 pounds per square inch? Just so, sir. Then, unless you quite fill the Nautilus, I do not see how you can draw it down to those depths. Professor, you must not confound statistics with dynamics or you will be exposed to grave errors. There is very little labor spent in attaining the lower regions of the ocean, for all bodies have a tendency to sink. When I wanted to find out the necessary increase of weight required to sink the Nautilus, I had only to calculate the reduction of the volume that seawater acquires according to the depth. That is evident. Now. If the water is not absolutely un incompressible, it is at least capable of very slight compression. Indeed, after the most recent calculation, this reduction is only 0.000436 of an atmosphere for each 30 feet of depth. If we want to sink 3,000 feet, I should keep account of the reduction of bulk under a pressure equal to that of a column of water of 1,000 feet. The calculation is easily verified. Now I have supplementary wet reservoirs capable of holding a hundred tons. Therefore, I can sink to a considerable depth. When I wish to rise to this level of the sea, I only let off the water and empty all the reservoirs if I want the Nautilus to emerge from the tenth part of her total capacity. I had nothing to object to these reasonings. I admit your calculations, Captain, I replied. I should be wrong to dispute them since <laughs> daily experience confirms them, but I foresee a real difficulty in the way. What, sir? When you are about 1,000 feet deep, the walls of the Nautilus bear a pressure of 100 atmospheres. If then, just now, you were to empty the supplementary reservoirs to lighten the vessel and to go up to the surface, the pumps must overcome the pressure of 100 atmospheres, which is 1,500 pounds per square inch. From that, a power 
That electricity alone can give, said the captain hastily. I repeat, sir, that the dynamic power of my engines is almost infinite. The pumps of the Nautilus have an enormous power, as you must have observed when their jets of water burst like a torrent upon the Abraham Lincoln. Besides, I use subsidiary reservoirs only to attain a mean depth of 750 to 1,000 fathoms, and that with a view of managing my machines. Also, when I have a mind to visit the depths of the ocean five or six miles below the surface, I make use of slower but not less infallible means. What are they, Captain? That involves my telling you how the Nautilus is worked. I am impatient to learn. The steer to this boat, to starboard, or port to turn in a word, following a horizontal plan, I use an ordinary rudder fixed on the back of the stern post, and with one wheel and some tackle to steer by. But I can also make the Nautilus rise and sink and sink and rise by vertical movement, by means of two inclined planes fastened to its sides, opposite the center of flotation. Planes that move in every direction, and that are worked by powerful levers from the interior. If the planes are kept parallel with the boat, it moves horizontally. If slanted, the Nautilus, according to this inclination, and under the influence of the screw, either sinks diagonally or rises diagonally, as it suits me. And even if I wish to rise more quickly to the surface, I ship the screw, and the pressure of the water causes the Nautilus to rise vertically, like a balloon filled with hydrogen. Bravo, Captain. But how can the steersman follow the route in the middle of the waters? The steersman is placed in a glazed box that is raised about the hull of the Nautilus and furnished with lenses. Are these lenses capable of resisting such pressure? Perfectly. Glass which breaks at a blow is nevertheless capable of offering considerable resistance. During some experiments of fishing by electric light in 1864 in the northern seas, we saw plates less than a third of an inch thick resist a pressure of 16 atmospheres. The glass that I use is not less than 30 times thicker. Granted, but after all, in order to see, the light must exceed the darkness, and in the midst of the darkness in the water, how can you see? Behind the steersman cage is placed a powerful electric reflector, the rays from which light up the sea for half a mile in front. Ah, bravo, bravo, Captain. Now, I can account for this phosphorescence in the supposed narwhal that puzzled us so. I now ask you if the boarding of the Nautilus and of the Scotia that has made such a noise has been the result of a chance rencontre? Quite accidental, sir. I was sailing only one fathom below the surface of the water when the shock came. It had no bad result. None, sir, but now you, your rencontre with the Abraham Lincoln? A rencontre. Let's see, a chance meeting. Oh, like a, like a re-encounter. Rin, rencontre. Professor, I am sorry I am sorry for one of the best vessels in the American Navy, but they attacked me and I was bound to defend myself. I concentrated myself, however, with putting the frigate hors de combat, and she will not have any difficulty in getting repaired at the next port. Ah, Commander, your Nautilus is certainly a marvelous boat. Yes, Professor, and I love it as if it were part of myself. If danger threatens one of your vessels on the ocean, the first impression is the feeling of an abyss above and below. On the Nautilus, men's hearts never fail them. No defects to be afraid of, for the double shell is as firm as iron. No rigging to attend to, no sails for the wind to carry away, no boilers to burst, no fire to fear. For the vessel is made of iron, not wood. No coal to run short, for electricity is the only mechanical agent. No collision to fear, for it alone swims in deep water. No tempest to brave, for when it dives below the water it reaches absolute tranquility. There, sir, that is the perfection of vessels. And if it is true that the engineer has more confidence in the vessel than the builder, and the builder than the captain himself, you understand the trust I repose in my Nautilus, for I am at once captain, builder, and engineer. But how could you construct this wonderful Nautilus in secret? Each separate portion, Monsieur Aranax, was brought from different parts of the globe. But these parts had to be put together and arranged. 
Professor, I had set up my workshops upon a desert island in the ocean. There my workmen, that is to say, the brave men that I instructed and educated, and myself have put together our Nautilus. Then when the work was finished, fire destroyed all trace of our proceedings on this island that I could have jumped over if I had liked. Then the cost of this vessel is great. Monsieur Aranax, an iron vessel costs 145 pounds per ton. Now the Nautilus weighed 1,500. It came, therefore, to 67,500 pounds and 80,000 pounds more for fitting it up and about 200,000 pounds with the works of art and the collections it contains. One last question, Captain Nemo. Ask it, Professor. Are you rich? Immensely rich, sir. And I could, without missing it, pay the national debt of France. I stared at this singular person who spoke thus. Was he playing upon my credulity? The future would decide that. All right, let's continue until we are at the end of the hour. And um, yes, so uh, it's interesting that the author chose to include all these uh, details. I mean, a lot of it seems to be world building, but I also would expect that people who are um, who were actually interested in engineering and, and the science behind it. I'm very curious uh, to know um, if these calculations are um, based in fact and based in reality. It seems they were so specific it makes you, the, as the reader, feel like you're being offered a, a scientific explanation. But given that this was uh, written in the 1860s, I'm, I'm very curious to know um, uh, an engineer's uh, point of view, so um, we'll definitely do some research into that. Okay, so let's continue uh, to uh, the Black River. The portion of the terrestrial globe which is covered by water is estimated at upwards of 80 millions of acres. This fluid mass comprises 2 billion 250 millions of cubic miles, forming a spherical body of a diameter of 60 leagues, the weight of which would be 3 quintillions of tons. To comprehend the meaning of these figures, it is necessary to observe that a quintillion is to a billion as a billion is to unity. In other words, there are as many billions in a quintillion as there are units in a billion. <laughs> Excuse me. This mass of fluid is equal to about the quantity of water which would be discharged by all the rivers of the earth in 40,000 years. During the geological epochs, the ocean originally prevailed everywhere. Then, by the degrees, in the Sil Silurian period, that is, so a long, long time ago, about 439 to 409 million years ago, the, oops, let's go back, in the Cerulean, Silurian <laughs> period, the tops of the mountains began to appear, the islands emerged, then disappeared, in partial deluges, reappeared, became settled, formed continents, till at length the earth became geographically arranged as we see it in the present day. The solid had rested from the liquid 37,657,000 square miles, equal to 12,960,000,000 of acres. The shape of continents allowed us to divide the waters into five great portions, the Arctic or frozen ocean, the Antarctic or frozen ocean, the Indian, the Atlantic, and the Pacific Oceans. The Pacific Ocean extends from north to south between the two polar circles and from east to west between Asia and America over an extent of 145 degrees of longitude. It is the quiet, quietest of the seas. Its currents are broad and slow. It has medium tides and abundant rain. Such was the ocean that my fate destined me first to travel over these strange conditions. Sir, said Captain Nemo, we will, if you please, take our bearings and fix the starting point of this voyage. It is a quarter to twelve. I will go up again to the surface. The captain pressed an electric clock three times. The pumps began to drive the water from the tanks. The needle of the mammometer marked by a different pressure the ascent of the Nautilus. Then it stopped. We have arrived, said the captain. I went to the central staircase, which opened onto the platform, clambered up the iron steps, and found myself on the upper part of the Nautilus. 
The platform was only three feet out of water. The front and back of the Nautilus was that of spindle shape, which caused it justly to be compared to a cigar. I noticed that its iron plates, slightly overlaying each other, resembled the shell which clothes the bodies of our large terrestrial reptiles. It explained to me how natural it was, in spite of all glasses, that this boat should have been taken for, for a marine animal. Toward the middle of the platform, the long boat, half buried in the hull of the vessel, formed a slight excrescence. excrescence. Let's see, a distinct outgrowth. Outgrowth. Okay, an unattractive or a superfluous addition. Okay, excrescence. Fore and aft rose two cages of medium height with inclined sides and partly closed by thick lenticular glasses, one destined for the steersman who directed the Nautilus, the other containing a brilliant lantern to give light on the road. The sea was beautiful, the sky pure. Scarcely could the long vehicle feel the broad undulations of the ocean. A light breeze from the east rippled the surface of the waters. The horizon, free from fog, made observation easy. Nothing was in sight. Not a quicksand, not an island, a vast desert. Captain Nemo, by the help of his sextant, took the la altitude of the sun, which ought also to give the latitude. He waited for some moments till its disks touched the horizon, while whilst taking observations, not a muscle moved. The instrument could not have been more motionless than a hand of marble. Twelve o'clock, sir, said he, when you like. I cast, I cast a look upon the ocean, slightly yellowed by the Japanese coast, and descended to the saloon. And now, sir, I leave you to your studies, added the captain. Our course is E in E. Our depth is twenty-six fathoms. Here are maps on a large scale by which you may follow it. The saloon is at your disposal, and with your permission, I will retire. Captain Nemo bowed, and I remained alone, lost in thoughts all bearing on the commander of the Nautilus. For a whole hour I was deep in these reflections, seeking to pierce this mystery so interesting to me. Then my eyes fell upon the vast planisphere spread upon the table, and I placed my finger on the very spot where the given latitude and longitude crossed. The sea has its large rivers, like the continents. They are special currents known by their temperature and their color. The most remarkable of these is known by the name of the Gulf Stream. Science has decided on the globe the direction of five principal currents. One in the North Atlantic, a second in the South, a third in the North Pacific, a fourth in the South, and a fifth in the Southern Indian Ocean. It is even probable that a sixth current existed at one time or another in the Northern Indian Ocean, when the Caspian and Aral Seas formed but one vast sheet of water. At this point indicated on the planisphere, one of these currents was rolling, the Kurosivo of the Japanese, the Black River, which, leaving the Gulf of Bengal, where it is warmed by the perpendicular rays of a tropical sun, crosses the Straits of Malacca along the coast of Asia, turns into the North Pacific to the Aleutian Islands, carrying with its trunks of camphor trees and other indigenous productions, and edging the waves of the ocean with the pure indigo of its warm water. It was this current that the Nautilus was to follow. I followed it with my eye, saw it lose itself in the vastness of the Pacific, and felt myself drawn with it, when Ned Land and Conceal appeared at the door of the saloon. My two brave companions remained petrified at the sight of wonders spread before them. "'Where are we? Where are we?' exclaimed the Canadian. "'In the museum at Quebec?' "'My friends,' I answered, making a sign for them to enter. "'You are not in Canada, but on board the Nautilus, fifty yards below the level of the sea.' "'But, Monsieur Aranax, said Ned Land, "'can you tell me how many men there are on board? Ten, twenty, fifty, a hundred? I cannot tell you, Mr. Land. It is better to abandon for a time all idea of seizing the Nautilus or escaping from it. This ship is a masterpiece of modern industry, and I should be sorry not to have seen it. Many people would accept the situation forced upon us, if only to move amongst such wonders. So be quiet, and let us try and see what passes around us. See, exclaimed the harpooner. But we can see nothing in this iron prison. We are walking, we are sailing blindly. Ned Land has scarcely, scarcely pronounced these words when all was suddenly darkness. 
the luminous ceiling was gone, and so rapidly that my eyes received a painful impression. We remained mute, not stirring and not knowing what surprise awaited us, whether agreeable or disagreeable. A sliding noise was heard. One would have said that panels were working at the sides of the Nautilus. It is the end of the end, said Ned Land. Suddenly, light broke at each side of the saloon through two oblong openings. The liquid mass appeared vividly lit up by the electric gleam. Two crystal plates separated us from the sea. At first, I trembled at the thought that this frail partition might break, but strong bands of copper bound them, giving an almost infinite power of resistance. The sea was, was distinctly visible for a mile all around the Nautilus. What a spectacle! What pen can describe it? Who could paint the effects of the light through those transparent sheets of water and the softness of the successive gradations from the lower to the superior strata of the ocean? We know the transparency of the sea and that its clearness is far beyond that of rock water. The mineral and organic substances which it holds in suspension heightens its transparency. In certain parts of the ocean, in the Antilles, under 75 fathoms of water can be seen with surprising clearness a bed of sand. The penetrating power of the solar rays does not seem to cease for a depth of 150 fathoms. But in this middle fluid traveled over by the Nautilus, the electric brightness was produced even in the bosom of the waves. It was no longer luminous water, but liquid light. We'll have to stop there today. I'll leave our bookmark. But um, what a exciting um, chapter this has been. It's well, you know, it's uh, the exciting part was getting to really better know Captain Nemo. I think a lot of this chapter function was functionally serving as um, a greater understanding that we're dealing with an, an engineering genius. And while we have learned some about him, and we know that he is uh, certainly a genius um, and has the, uh, I don't, he's very, very wealthy. He's able to. Um, craft this in the, the Nautilus um, to take on board and educate uh, the, these men that run it. And he seems to want uh, Monsieur Aranax to stay. I mean, knowing that he is a fellow um, scientist and naturalist, um, perhaps he has some, some plans for Mr. Uh, Aranax. We'll, we'll find out. There's still a lot of mystery ab around him, even though we learned quite a lot of the details of how the Nautilus works. Um, I'm also really interested in seeing what we can find on um, whether, uh, on like an engineer's perspective of all of the science that we, uh, the scientific facts that were, that were thrown at us. So, um, uh, yes, so thank you so much for joining us. And I had also wanted to remind you that today uh, we have our 2 p.m. live stream. That's going to be about Hamilton and uh, Marie Walker and Glenn Kyle are going to be uh, comparing um, Hamilton the man versus Hamilton the musical. And um, I'm really looking forward to that one. Uh, also stay tuned for more information about our digital memberships, which um, you can become a digital member as for as low as $3 a month. Um, you can of course donate uh, whatever amount makes sense for you, but uh, we'll have more details on that shortly. So until tomorrow, please uh, stay safe, stay happy, and uh, I hope to see you at our program a little bit later today. That's uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. All right, see you then. Mm -hmm.